Yeah, I'm very happy to be here, and um, it's a great pleasure to talk to those people who are actually, I think, which where this is pretty much in the center of their attention when I think about um, intermolecular interactions and how to calculate intermolecular interactions. And we start off with surfaces, um, and we go over molecules and into molecular solids. And I will try to give you a small, brief overlook um, how. Um, how I see those things, how I see the electronic structure theory, and then um, I will try to combine methods, and you will see how far we get with this, um, and how accurate methods are in general. If we talk about electronic structure theory, I'm just coming from quantum chemistry, we want to calculate, for example, intermolecular interactions, and we have several methods for our, at our disposal. Um, we start usually off with the most accurate methods, those are post hoc methods, like, for example, a couple cluster or um, DMRG or whatever you may think about nowadays. Then you have density functional theory. Um, then you have semi-empirical methods and the force fields. While the semi-empirical methods and the force fields are nowadays getting more and more replaced by machine-learned um, force fields or machine-learned um, kind of methods. Um, then you can try to apply this electronic structure theory, of course, to molecules, surfaces, molecular crystals, and at the end of the day, to liquids. Um, I put surfaces somewhere in between because as a surface, of course, you have a molecule on a solid. So the question is how to calculate those and how you can get accurate results for those as well. So in theoretical or computational chemistry, I'm a chemist, um, despite most of those people reading physicists here, I think. Um, we have thus those methods at our disposal, which are the post hoc method methods like OCI or CCSD if you want to density functional theory with, let's say, going with the canonical density functional theory to about 2000 atoms, canonical post hoc method theory, very, very few atoms, only about 30 atoms, and then semi empirical methods and force fields. And then at the very end, you have those coarse grain methods, but the accuracy for Intermolecular interactions is, of course, very, very high for those four such talk methods. And then you sacrifice accuracy for the fact that you are um, to, can do more and more atoms and large and large calculations in general. And um, by doing this, this is, of course, CCSD for HST. I already said that. This is the so called gold standard of quantum chemistry, which has this very high accuracy. In our opinion, and I will show you why we think that this has this high accuracy. And um, usually for binding energies or something like this, this has an accuracy of chemical accuracy of less than a K calcomole. mole. For intermolecular interactions, we of course get more accurate. So, also in addition, you can of course try to bridge all of those kind of different theories that I just talked about. From post hoc methods to the force field, which are, as I said, force fields and semi empirical methods, which are getting nowadays replaced by machine learning and can bridge them by, for example, um, just embedding post hoc methods into DFT. This is one possibility if you wanted to. Um, another possibility is a neat little method which is called um, DFT ZAT, it's symmetry and depth of perturbation theory, where you have the, your monomer. And the monomer, you just do your DFT calculation with, and then you do the dimer calculation um, with perturbation theory. So you interact those two DFT monomers with perturbation theory. So you have certain advantages by doing so. Um, then, of course, you have QMM methods, which this Nobel Prize, there was a Nobel Prize several years ago for that, uh, where you just embedded, for example, semi empirical methods into force fields. And of course, you also have delta machine learning where you just use the force field or semi empirical method, and then you use machine learning in order to go one rank further, or you use DFT to get to couple cluster accuracy. So there are certain methods like this, which you um, in general try, can try to combine. And I will also talk about the fact how to combine those. Of course, all of those kind of bridge, bridges. There, you can just go here and, for example, not only do the CCSD for MCC calculation, but you can do a CCSD calculation, or you can do an MP2 calculation, or you can do an RPA calculation. And you can, of course, then combine 
those little kind of methods with each other as well. This is the so-called W1 method. There are other methods to do this. For example, if you use CCSD at a very, very large basis set, plus then parentheses T part at the small basis set, for example, in order to get high accuracy statistics. Also, if you think about the gas plus molecules in the solids, if you bridge them, you have a gas of atmospheres. And this is what I will just what we are basically interested in. Um, as I said, four weeks ago, I had several other things which I marked here, but of course, I try to um, get the more recent work in there. So now I will talk about surfaces um, and molecules on surfaces. I will talk about intermolecular actions. And at the end of the day, we'll talk about um, QM, QM development for molecular crystals because this is the most recent success story that we have. Okay, surfaces. So this is something like about 10 years old and started actually in the group of Professor Sauer at the Humboldt University of Berlin. And we started with this and um, Professor Sauer came up to me and I started with this project and he said, well, um, we have this one paper here, you see it from 2010, um, and we have two kilojoule per mole difference when we have the methane absorption on magnesium oxide. So he comes up and says, well, where does those two kilojoule uh, kilo per mole come from? This may not be as much, but still it's about more than 10%. And um, in my opinion, it was more than this kind of method, this accuracy of kappa cluster could possibly, because we claim that we have kappa cluster values here, the accuracy of kappa cluster de deviation um, was in our, or in my opinion, too large. I mean, um, Professor Zorro's opinion. So what we did was then QM QM calculations. Again, you do the inner part with the post hoc prop method. Um, in this case, only M2, but we can do exchange that with kappa cluster, but the geometry is something like the inner part to do with M2. And because you have magnesium oxide, you can really cut out this one little cluster here. So cut it out, take um, the PDE, for example, or the periodic value, and put in something at the basis set limit with MP2. So this is very, very easy. It's a very, very easy embedding scheme. You don't have any density or anything else. It's just a mechanical embedding, so-called mechanical embedding. So you just take this low-level kind of periodic system, this is a blue C, which you have around the system. Then you do the high-level carpet cluster calculation or post up epoch calculation and subtract this little cluster. Because it's so simple, the advantage is that we can do this for gradients and also if we wanted to for um, frequencies. Okay, in order to be sure, of course, we can compare this kappa cluster, or we can compare this MP2, which we originally did with kappa cluster. We can do this long range term and use MP2 instead of PD. And basically, this is for the long range term. If we just go larger, 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 you see here we have a kind of this would be CO on magnesium oxide, but we can do this, of course, for CH4 on magnesium oxide and go larger, larger, larger. This is about a slab of Mg81 or 81, which we have this methane molecule. Okay, also what we can do is to use periodic electrostatic embedding. So what you do is you just use a small cluster. This is of course this Mg909 cluster, which you use, but you put this into point charges. This is already some sort of QM, QM model of the thing. So you can also put this then into this kind of point charges and try to go larger, 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 um, and why we do this, I will explain to you very soon, because we have a certain advantage with this periodic electrostatic embedding. So, of course, we can just do this and compare now the periodic calculation with, let's say, the lip or with density functional theory. And you see that this um, charges will start to overestimate the interaction energy. This is basically because you have an interaction you have a problem, of course. You have a problem because you want to have this interaction energy between the MG909 cluster or the MG05 cluster and this, um, this molecule you want to have as accurate as possible. So you need to go to very, very large basis sets. If you go to large basis sets, you get the problem that you get interactions with the point charges. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You will always get them. And that leads actually to this overestimation here if you do the periodic electrostatic embedding. 
If you don't do any periodic electrostatic embedding, you see you're done. nicely converging towards a periodic value, which you can do nowadays with DFT easily. So this is not a problem to do this with DFT. And this would be then the correction, of course, between this MD909 cluster. If we do this, let's say we have this exact here. Yeah? So this exact value, and this would be the correction with this um, kind of function. Now, the problem is, if you think about this QMQM -QM or this embedding, well, you can always use another function. And this is, of course, a problem of DFT in general. So we use the PVE function, and you see here, this value is about, let's say, three or something like this, and this value is about five. So you get different values. This is two kilojoule per mole. This is quite significant. So you get a difference between PVE and DLIP. And the question is, which function was correct? No one knows. Yeah? No one can tell you that either this function is correct or this function is correct. So, but we did the same thing, like I said, with, with the MP2 calculations. So with the MP2 calculations, we, you see here, you now need to extrapolate and get even larger basis set or get the same large basis set you see and do the extrapolation. But in general, we now have the advantage that this periodic electrostatic embedding is overestimating this. And this is most likely underestimating it a bit. So our kind of um, oops, long range correction will be somewhere in the middle. And you see the long range correction between MP2 or for MP2 at least, and we will get something very similar for the cluster. The long range correction is closer to this PDIP value than the PVE value. Interestingly, PVE gives the correct value at the very end. So the periodic value. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's plus D2 in this case, but you can use D3 or something. It's D2 where you replace the neon D2 atoms. There are several papers by Joachim Sauer later where he claims that this is the most accurate thing to do. So anyway, so the point is this PVE plus this D2 star or however you call it is giving actually quite good results in comparison to MP2 if we say that MP2 is very, very good and electrostatically doing this quite well. Okay, so now we can start to put in all the effects. Of course, we need to just put in the effect of the monolayer. And if we take all the effects now and have this long range correction in there, which is about 1.8 kilojoule per mole, of course, we immediately go on between the two experiments. So this is now, we can say, okay, this long range correction wasn't in there before. This was why we underestimated it before. Now we get the kind of real value by putting this long range correction by MP2 in there. And a couple plus the long range correction will be rather similar. So in general, now we're directly between the two experiments and we are happy. Okay. So um, now we can go ahead and just say, we don't want to take a look at only at CH4, but we want to take a look, for example, at C2H6. Do the same calculation, not very difficult. And then we get a dissociation energy of 18.9. Okay, third value. The third value was CO. And CO had a value at that point in time of the kind of here in this, um, for the experimental value of 13.6 kilojoule. And if you're coming from chemistry, this may be a bit varying or perhaps not the, um, you may wonder if this correct, it's really correct this value. Because if you think about this, well, it, it's supposed to be almost the same value as the CH4, the isolated CH4. And the question is why? It has, should have larger C6 coefficients, should have a larger dispersion, component in this case. And as a second thing, not only the larger dispersion component should be there, it should also um, start to build up a dipole moment on this MGO surface, the CO. So it should be, in reality, if you think about this, it should be bigger. But there are many, many people, especially, or many, let's say, theoretical people, theoreticians, who confirm this value. Because this was the experimental value and they confirm. You may argue why they did, did it and how this they came up with the numbers, but at the end of the day, they confirmed the value. Something which is also varying is, of course, that the distance is much, much smaller on the surface of this kind of CO or nanometers. So now we did exactly the same thing what we did for methane, and we went up to 21 kilojoule per mole. So this is now quite significant. This is almost 50% error. Yeah. 
So we got 21 kilojoules. Okay, and then this was our best estimate, even the embedded one embedded energy where we said we overestimated it is about 22 kilojoules. So then we talked to the experimentalists at that point in time. And they said, yeah, we have this Arrhenius curve, we have the prefactor, and the best which we can do with the Arrhenius prefactor is that we can go from 13.6 to 16.4 kilojoules per month. So this is the absolute best that we can do. We are still five kilojoules per month off. And then there was, of course, the question is, well, are we really five kilojoules per mole off? We wrote the paper. Um, it was written that we had five kilojoules per mole off, but we had a very, very good referee. And this is, I very often hope that, you see, this is where their refereeing system is really great. Because the referee said, well, but there's a second experiment, which was disregarded most of the time. And that's 20.6 kilojoules. So this is actually very, very close. And then there was a third experiment, also about 20 kilojoules, confirming this is the same group as um, which did the first experiment, so which confirmed this number. The question is now, how good are we? Is this all because of error rate cancellation? Um, what is the accuracy of Kappa cluster in general for even those periods? So one thing which we noticed, and this is where we think that it came from, is a high coverage. So basically what is happening on magnesium oxide is that you don't have a full coverage because they start to repel each other because they start to build up the platform moment. And they are close enough to start to repel each other. And we have at a high coverage, we have something like about 16 kilojoules or more as a possibility. So possibly the temperature absorption, they just wait till they see the first CO flying off. And then they say, oh, it's flying off at 16 kilojoules or more and didn't see the second peak or the other peak. And then also I went to the group of Professor Seifer and he was mostly interested not on CO on magnesium oxide, but he was interested in CO on sodium chloride. So CO on sodium chloride has a kind of certain interesting effect. The interesting effect is so-called Davidoff splitting. So you have a kind of one CO, of course, has a vibration of frequency, and two COs will have a vibration of frequency which go together, and one which go anti-symmetry wise. And so you would have two. And if you have many, many of them, you will start to get a bend. There are people um, from Göttingen who do, um, Alec Wotke, who do those kind of experiments. They have like a nature paper from that about five years ago or something like this on this kind of system where they then do energy pooling and go higher and higher and higher. So they try to store in the vibrational energy, they try to store, um, they try to store energy, which is very, very interesting. So that was the kind of thing that Peter Zadfan was interested in. Okay, so now, we took this kind of system and just tried to do this, give it the same treatment that we did before, but also cut out the clusters. And when we optimize the clusters, we get something very, very fun. And those are actually spirals. So what you have is actually you have two non chiral systems. And at the end of the day, you get a chiral system. This is, of course, a boundary effect. And you'll see this later. But nevertheless, you have one thing is the CO builds up a dipole moment. So two COs want to look into the same direction. However, they of course want to also go into the center because their most COs are in the center. So this means that the combination of van der Waals and electrostatic interaction gives you spirals actually, which is interesting. So you go to very large spirals actually, in fact, if you do this boundary. Okay, so those are very close in energy. So this is a kind of minimum. This is a zero, so the structure at zero Kelvin, which has been confirmed that they all, the electrostatics win at the end. But if I put the spiral back into the periodic calculation, you see I'm rather close to this kind of 1.75 kilojoules, which is interesting, yeah? So this is getting even more stabilized for larger spirals. So, um, well, the one question is how can you prove it? Well, possibly with surface uh, vibration spectra, you can prove this. Although this is, of course, very difficult. If you take an AFM or something else, you put it in the middle, of course, all the CO molecules will go into the center. But this is still interesting. Possibly they will, hopefully, or hopefully they will see this experimentally once that I really can confirm those spirals as a new case. Okay, now we have 
more or less with detail figured out what, what possibly the problem was, but how's the accuracy for intermolecular interaction? So I then went ahead and took the most strongest bonds for which we can think about. Those are hydrogen bonds. So they can go up to, well, 100, more than 100 kilojoule per mole, of course, if you take charged hydrogen bonds or something like this. And these are certain sets that you can take a look at. And I wanted to take a look how accuracy the cluster was. And, well, somewhat surprisingly, the cluster gave a huge or uh, really, really good accuracy and was very, very close to the full CI limit for those very, very small, of course, little molecules, little diamonds like this. Something which is also interesting is that the PBE, even plus V2 or V3 or V4 or MPB, it doesn't matter, um, gives per hydrogen bond, in this case, for those very, very small clusters, huge errors. And this is a large error of about seven decades. Okay, then you go ahead and take a look what the basis set effect would be for the neutral diamonds. Those are all counterpoise corrected basis um, or counterpoise corrected values. And you see here that you basically need diffuse functions in order to get even to the um, accuracy of 2.0 kilojoule per mole for this kind of, and in order to compare this to the basis set limit size. So you see even a quadruple zeta basis set will give you not so good results in this case for the small dimers and if you start to tear them. Okay, so what about very large molecules? Uh, because you always make a come up and say, uh, we have this kind of, kind, of, kind of paper here and there we said that diffusion Monte Carlo and the cluster is like deviating by so much. So now when they're deviating by so much, perhaps this is not so accurate. You see here, the minimum, the distance between the kind of cup plus and the diffusion Monte Carlo method was not 0.2 or 0.3 kilojoule per mole. Here, the deviation between the two of them is 36, 46, 46 kilojoule per mole. Yeah. So this is a bit different, 46 kilojoule per mole, not 0.2 or 0.3. So um, is this cup cluster really holding this accuracy if we go to very, very large molecules. And this is a so-called L7 set, which they looked at. And the last one was this bucket catcher where they saw the largest deviation, but they already see it here. For example, for the coronine dimer, they see, start to see this problem. See it also for this kind of system. So they see it for very large systems. So the question is, does it hold for very large systems in general? So, but if we don't go here from system size, and they say here increased complexity, if we think that this may not be increased complexity, but it's just a system size, yeah, then we can, of course, try to take a look, not at system size, but at ever larger molecules. So this would be ethylene stacks, for example. So there are ethylene stacks, this one ethylene trimer stack in, no, this is not ethylene, but ethane stacks in the L7 set. But you can see here, they have very, very nice kind of straight lines, if you think about this. And you go from, let's say, the dimer, but you make the dimer larger, 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 larger. And you can now take a look at several methods. This is whatever you're liking. And there has been, for example, kind of discussion that RPA is much better than CCS difference T, or ZAPT should be better than CCS difference T because they have um, the apprentice T part will start to overestimating, start overestimating the interaction, like MB2, for example, oh, I don't have MB2 in here, but MB2.5 already is overestimating very much the interaction and MB2 even much, much more. So the question is, is the apprentice T part messing up or kind of very large cover class? So in this case, actually, um, we can now start, of course, because we have very, very small system, calculate two of them, this that we have the same number or the same kind of system values for um, other stacks and we'll show them shortly and you see here that ccs difference t is very very close to ccs difference tq so unfortunately or interestingly enough we still get the same slope as we did before interesting um there's more deviation actually for the dimer you see the dimer is a bit more deviating by itself but the slopes, which you see here, are very much the same. Okay, now I talk to people and they say, well, it may not be the apprentice T part or the post 
CCSP apprentice T part, it may be the base. Well, the base sets should, if I um, do go to larger and larger base sets, if they get, have a problem, they should not be in a straight line anymore. So if I have the basis sets in a straight line, I can do this extrapolation actually for the basis set as well. And that's exactly what I can do. You see there, it's perfect straight lines, basically. So you see here, the double zeta basis set is perhaps not that nice, it's underestimating. Then the augmented triple zeta is um, overestimating, but all the other basis sets are basically for very, very close to each other. Okay. And those are now everything steps actually, for which we see the same um, behavior. And then you can say, well, it may not be the basis set, perhaps it's the local coupling stuff. You see here, all those R squared values are actually basically one or very, very, very close to one. Straight lines, perfect straight lines. And then we can, of course, take, just compare the canonical to the very tight value or very, very tight value, very tight, tight normal. Normal is, of course, something which you wouldn't do. You see here, you're very far off, but you're approaching the canonical value. And this means it can't be local coupling either. So basically, this means we have no effect of the local coupling plus and basis set, and they can be converged if we go to ever better systems or ever larger basis sets and so on. And we have several series with straight lines. So I just showed you two. We have more of them actually. For the athlete stacks, the difference between the extrapolated interaction energy of 132 atoms. That would be the size of this kind of large sparkle catcher that they have, less than 0.3 kilo to per mole. The difference for the extrapolated CCS between C interaction energy of this kind of 175 kilo to per mole, it's less than 0.8. And if you think about this, the MP2 and MP3 difference, if we think about that this may be something, um, then we also have less point, an estimate of less than 0.5 kilo. So there's almost no difference between coupled cluster, CCST prince T, the gold standard of quantum chemistry, and this kind of CCST T prince Q, which is um, almost actually then at the kind of full CI limit. So there's probably no argument that this is so close to the full CI limit that there's almost nothing behind that. So CCST prince T, in our opinion, is very, very accurate. And I'm looking forward to more results, to more groups and also very much to quantum Monte Carlo results on this kind of systems, if they really start to give a large deviation now, because that would prove our kind of theory that it is not CCS T, but more of quantum Monte Carlo. Okay, last subject is then, um, I will talk about molecular crystals. And I became, well, interested in molecular crystals about, about 2013, 2012. Um, of course, you can think about several polymorphic structure. For example, this is THF, and you see that THF, for example, sits on top of each other. Well, um, no, this is tetrahydrothiophene, THT, on this THF, tetrahydrothiophene, and you see that they have very, very different crystal structures. And this means that um, once you can change very little or you change something within the molecular crystal, this is the so-called subject of crystal engineering, we call it, that you can change the crystal structure. Of course, in many cases, you get possibly even something like THF or any other kind of systems, you get several polymorphs. So, which means the very, the motivation is that you have different polymorphic forms of, for example, benzene or any kind of molecule that you look at. And um, if you think about this, if you have benzene, for example, you can have a benzene like this, and you can have a molecular crystal like this. And those are two different polymorphs. They will have, of course, slightly different properties, but this is, of course, very, very important for pharmaceutical industry because the solvation of those kind of polymorphic forms are very, very different. So this means if you, for example, eat it just a um, pill or something like this of one polymorphic form, um, that may dissolve in the mouth. And the other polymorphic form may dissolve only in your stomach or something like this much later. So this is important. Yeah, this is important to fine tune possibly your medication. So the solid state form of any drug can be patented. This is of course more practical reasons. So pharmaceutical industry will be very very interested in just um, 
patenting a certain drug, um, and if a generic company would find another molecule or another kind of form, polymorphic form of that molecule, they can circumvent that patent, in which, let's say, millions and millions of euros went into. So this is a problem. Or something else which can happen, you have um, a certain form which you try to disperse in some sort of liquid or something else, and you would get all the sudden crystals in this liquid. And then you will get a different concentration, which you don't want. Yeah. So this, there are many, many ways that you, why you want to take a look at this kinetics and why you want to understand those kinetics and why you want to understand what kind of different polymorphs there can be. So many, many drug molecules nowadays about, I think about 70% exhibit polymorphism. So this was of one of the kind of um, one polymorph, which was or one system, which was to see you know, also have cis trans kind of polymorph in the different or cis trans polymorphs for this molecule. And this is actually also a drug molecule. This is a very, very large multi trillion dollar business. And the state of the art is that those functionals, they usually yield the good results, like PDE with something. But I showed you before, as soon as we go to hydrogen bonds, those functionals are not that good. Yeah? So as soon as we now just walk away from, let's say, the more normal molecular crystal and go towards um, um, a hydrate or something like this of this crystal, we get into trouble. So those functionals like PBE, MED, or something like this will then start accumulating in the short range, a large error, very large, which has somehow has to be compensated. So hybrid functionals are very time demanding and cost of methods, extremely time demanding. And we don't have great. So why would we use hybrid functionals, of course, instead of TGAs? One thing is that you have a much better conformational analysis for the monomers. So if you have a large kind of monomer, there are kind of certain kind of monomers. If you have a cis or trans, this is exactly this what you have here. If you have a cis or trans monomer, those kind of energy difference are is much, much better described by hybrid functionals because they have um, much less self-interaction than the GTS. So you have a better short range behavior. That's what I said before. You have also much better dipoles and polarizabilities. So your electrostatics are much better. So you get, let's say, also within the intermolecular interaction, but uh, um, let's say interactions, which is, of course, related to the hydrogen bond problems. You get also better ranking the polymers, but hybrid functions are also much smaller, uh, much slower, and you can think about this. Um, you see, I'm doing this kind of trick, which you always have. Uh, if you're going to the supermarket, I say up to, yeah. So uh, this is, of course, not always the case, yeah. So up to means up to, yeah. So yeah. anyway, so we have multimer, and what we do is now we do exactly almost the same thing which we did for the um, for the kind of systems that we looked at before, which was this, um, which was the surfaces. So now we cut out, for example, we could cut out each one of the monomers. So we can cut out this monomer and replace it by a hybrid. We can cut out this monomer and replace it by a hybrid, and so on. So if we do this for all the monomers, of course, we do this as a sum, because we have several of them. We can cut out all those kind of different ones, yes, and replace them by hybrid. This would be just then the monomer. So this is the very, very easiest correction that you can do. So you just take out all the monomers, this one, this one, this one, this one, and replace it by a hybrid. This would be so-called, well, um, very easy embedding, subtractive embedding again, and very easy embedding, which is called ME1, we call it, monomer embedding. Of course, you can go ahead and just take all the dimers and embed them. So those would be the two dimers that you could take, and then you take those two dimers, and this is the ME2. And basically what you do is, for example, here you just have the interaction between A and B, and then you have, for example, between this B and A, and between this A and A and B and B, and try to take all the dimers within a certain distance. And because <clears throat> in our opinion, in our case, what we did, um, that we are just embedding, for example, a hybrid functional into um, PBE, like PBE zero into PBE, we have the big advantage that we um, have something like an HSE functional, if you're familiar with those kind of things. 
So we get a short range functional, a short range hybrid functional, and a long range GTA. So this is something which is, of course, um, in this case, something which is similar. And if the functionals, two functionals stay but rather similar, we get very, very good results. We can do the same thing for gradients and stress tensors and for harmonic vibrational properties, like I said. So this is a big advantage of this mechanical embedding. Have our own code, use this with FHI instances. So how good are those kind of R? How far do you need to go for those embedding things in order to get good results? So we have the PDE and BD results, which deviate from the zero line, which is PDE zero and BD. So we try to see how much we deviate one from the other. We could, of course, use also PDE plus D, plus D3 and PDE zero plus D3, or we could use BLIP plus D3 and D3 lip plus D3. So there are certain methods which work rather well. And then you, for example, have this kind of distance or the kind of problems, which you see, for example, entrazine is not very well described by PBE MBD um, if you take the kind of relative lattice energy and compare it to the kind of baseline hybrid values. And now we start to embed. So we first replace all the monomers. And you see, we get somewhat better, but not this much better. Okay, then we do the dimers. And so we do the dimers. And you see, in some cases, we actually get worse, which is very disappointing. But in general, we get better. And we just can get away almost with a two, two or three, uh, three or four n string cutoff, with a three n string cutoff, which is a very, very short cutoff. So we have, we do not have to calculate many, many of those dimers. And then, of course, we go to the trimers. And you see the trimers here, if we have the trimers at three, four angstrom cutoff, the large cutoff with the trimers, we're basically the baseline. And we get very, very good results here at 0.4 kilojoule per mole. And this means we really, really need to go to the trimers. And if we go to the trimers, we get the kind of real values. And we do not need to go any further. We do not need to go to tetramers, at least. But still, the trimers are, of course, then the most expensive part at the end of the day. But nevertheless, so the monomers to dimers, you get a certain, so the, to the monomers, you get a large improvement or a relatively large improvement already. Then to the dimers, you get some sort of improvement, but not as much. But if you want to get the real value, you need to include the trimers. And this is, of course, something which is important. Okay, you can do the same thing for cell volumes, and we'll see the same problem for cell volumes. Get the same kind of thing. If you do the trimers, you're doing well for the cell volumes. Okay, so then you can, of course, take a look at the cell volumes, what happened. So, for example, for certain systems, for the dimers, it goes into what? So, the monomers and the PBE. MBD, it has an error. You see the lattice constant, not has an error. The lattice constant, one of the lattice constants is about. Five angstrom, it's very, very close to PBE zero MBD value. The monomer is also fine, but for the dimer, it walks away and it goes back to the trimer. So this is something with the trimers where you're actually fine. The same thing now for this embedding with the trimers or dimers, actually for the phonons, you're actually with the dimers fine. Okay, so which means if you take a look for the summaries of the energies, we get for the monomer embedding, you get about 30% improvement for the set that we looked at, dimer embedding 40% and trimer embedding 90%. For atomic forces, you get already for the dimer embedding 98% of improvement. So you don't need much for this. For the cell volume, you get 25%. And for the dimer embedding 40% improvement, but for the trimer embedding, you again get 90%. And for the vibration frequencies, um, for the zero point energies and all this. Um, and the kind of um, thermal values we get already at the diamond level, you're fine. So, which means we have new QM, QM methods or those QM, QM methods, new, you can say, I agree with it, but nevertheless, those QM, QM methods are systematically improvable. They basically give the same results. They're embarrassingly terrible scaling because you can put every kind of those fragments on another computer um, and you get a speed up, and I'm doing the same trick, up to 30% to 100% faster, and we have a nice alternative for hydrogen. Okay, 
So now we put this map into the test, and this is the blind test. We have two phases in this blind test. The first one is the generation phase, so you don't get any crystal structure. And the second one is a re-ranking phase. For each compound, you get 500 structures. So one would be really that you just um, generate your from your kind of monomer, you generate all the kind of different possible crystal structures um, and try to figure out which one um, is the real kind of system. And the second one is re ranking this. So this is actually going to be published, I think, next month or something like this. Okay, so the first thing is the phase one, it's the generation of the system 31. Um, what you do is, first of all, you just generate all the conformers for this kind of system. This is the system which we have got. So you've got this system, which is, of course, not a 3D system. You see here, this looks a bit different. If you put it in 3D, you generate all the conformers. I think there were only four conformers for this. this book. Oh, no, 11 conformers. This was rather easy with those 11 conformers. Then you generate a landscape. So you just put them all into certain crystal structures. And then you start to do first force field um, optimization. Then you do flexible force field optimization. Then you do the T calculation. And at the end, very end, you do light optimization. And we found the three kind of major systems in this case. Only I'm showing you this molecule because we have been more successful for this molecules. For the larger ones, we didn't find, for example. Okay, so for the re-ranking, there we did quite well, actually, because if you do this, you can now do a hierarchical system again. So you do PVE plus MVD for a single point light basis set. You optimize it. You just go to larger basis sets. And then we do apply our methods that I've been showing you. And if we did this, we rank the experimental systems as number one, or experimentally three polymorphs, which were found as number one, three, and four, which is a rather good result. And then for large systems, as I said, you do this hierarchical one, where you do this many body embedding with a um, type basis set as a single point. And for small systems, you can just um, do also this, but you can course, through the whole vibration and frequency and optimize it also at the light basis. So now this is the success of this multiple embedding method. Here there were two experimental polymorphs being found. So those were ranked number one and number two, interestingly enough, with our methods. Here this experimental polymorph was ranked number one in the second re-ranking phase, where you got, as I said, 500 structures, and they asked you which is the thermodynamically most stable one. And we found it here that we found the three most stable ones. And this was a big system, which we attempted also in the first phase. And you see here the experimental polymorphs has been ranked number 24, or have been ranked number 24 and 25. This is probably too large and too flexible so that there is a kinetic kind of reason why this is actually, um, why this we found this, uh, why this has been found and not other kind of, or one molecular, one crystal structure has been found and the other one has, and why this didn't give us a thermodynamically more stable crystal structure, which is a problem in this case. But um, this is something where people need to start attacking this. And this means we are by far not yet there when we do, especially when we want to predict the crystal structures of flexible large molecules, because this was one of the kind of pharmaceutical molecules, which was the most interesting one, actually. And none, none of the groups got this kind of experimental system or put the experimental system then in number one. This one was a kind of um, was a salt, you see here, a co-crystal, and that we um, ranked the experimental polymorphs as number one. We were among the best form performances in this re-ranking phase, and we have an 80% success rate. You see four out of the five polymorphs or most stable polymorphs we found. Okay. With this, we come to acknowledgements. I have to acknowledge, or I would like to, of course, acknowledge funding from the FWF, from the EU, from the West Visiting Professorship at the Weizmann Institute, former postdocs and current senior scientists. This is my current group. Of course, I haven't done this by myself. Um, so most of the people um, are Professor, Ho uh, Professor Dr. Hoya and um, Alexander List who did this. And then we have the collaborators. Thank you for your attention.